Welcome to all to our first uh, NOR Ed for 2021. This, believe it or not, is our 14th year of NOR Ed. Uh, we're now virtual uh, to all of our NOR offices. And because of COVID, uh, all of our offices are still closed and we're all working from home. So that includes the Toronto office, Ottawa, Calgary, Edmonton, in the US, Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, Sacramento, and in the UK, London, Glasgow, Inverness, Cambridge, and Newcastle. And also a very special welcome to um, our guests and friends uh, who are also joining in uh, today for this uh, NORED. And starting as of uh, last year, we um, um, our goals for NORED are to teach, learn, and improve continuously, and believe me, that will never end. The guest speakers are balanced under three areas, architecture, engineering, and the master series. And for this year, uh, we're going to be under the same um, structure. So we have quite um, a very strong and, and exciting um, uh, lineup of speakers this year. Um, and I, um, Roman, if you could, could give me the next slide, please. I'm going to introduce the speakers for this year. Not all of the speakers have um, uh, totally been confirmed uh, with actual dates. Um, and some of them we're still um, negotiating with them and, and talking to them. But uh, I will share um, uh, the speakers that, that we're talking to right now, and uh, some of these are confirmed and, and, and will be happening in the next few months. So we're starting off with our first one that I'll, I'll talk to uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, in March, uh, Gianluca Delufo uh, from Genoa um, is a, a very talented uh, architect uh, that, that does a lot of work in uh, Northern Italy and, and beyond. Uh, in April, uh, Ivano Gianola, um, who is um, a, a talented architect uh, from Switzerland. And in May, Paolo Desideri. And uh, Paolo is, um, uh, will be talking uh, in the master series about Pierluigi Nervi. And uh, Paolo's father was actually Pierluigi Nervi's partner. Uh, and Paolo wrote uh, the very first book on Pierre Luigi Ginervi. So, uh, and he also teaches at the university in Rome, and has his own firm. So, uh, really looking forward to uh, uh, that master series uh, lecture. And then in June, uh, Jacques Herzog. Most of you may know of him. And then in the fall, um, September, uh, Charles Renfro. Uh, we we are still in discussions uh, with Charles, potentially for next year, this year. And then October, uh, John Straub from the University of Waterloo. And then in November, uh, Carlo Ratti uh, from um, uh, MIT. Uh, and he hails, uh, his firm is in uh, Torino. And um, uh, that's going to be a, a very interesting uh, uh, guest speaker. And in December, Rick Haldenby uh, from the University of uh, Waterloo. So for today, um, engineering bespoke facades. So these are not suits, but they are custom facades. So Roman Scheiber uh, from Nippers Heilberg from Stuttgart, Germany, and the firm has an office in New York. Uh, Roman actually spent some time in their uh, Stuttgart office as well as their uh, office in New York up until about um, April of, of last year, of course. Uh, currently, he, like all of us, is, is working from home, um, uh, as most of us are through this pandemic. But Nevers Heilberg is unique in providing innovative design solutions to building cladding challenges. And uh, as most of you know, um, uh, building cladding is, is, is one of those elements that I suppose most architects will tell you that they know everything there is to know about building cladding. And I can tell you that there, 
they're all lying to you. Uh, and, and it takes very talented um, um, specialist firms like Roman's Roman firm to come in and help us. And um, uh, a, a lot of times it's um, uh, in, in dealing with specialty facades that um, are unique uh, and, and challenging. And, and today Roman is going to share uh, some some of the work on on a number of buildings and if you've seen the the invitation that we sent out to all of you um, uh, the the buildings are very unique and he's worked with some of the the best architects in the world on those those buildings next slide please next slide please So Roman studied architecture and urban design at the University of Stuttgart, as well as facade engineering at the University of Applied Science in Augsburg. After graduating, he, um, uh, the engineering of, uh, he joined the engineering firm of Nippers Halberg in 2007, and was the first employee trained as a facade specialist as both an architect and certified facade engineer. He established the facades group within the engineering firm and now leads the team in New York City and Stuttgart. In his early years, he worked on a number of large scale projects in Asia, such as uh, the Bajon uh, International Airport and Jizen uh, or the Expo uh, access in uh, Shanghai. After opening an office in New York City uh, in 2009, the North American market came more into focus where he worked on some of the most recognized facades projects in the past decade. Roman's Association to Structural Engineering, Environmental Design, and deep knowledge of the largest fabrication techniques has allowed him to transfer structural efficiency and thermal performance into facade design. The core aspiration of the work is to create a balanced link between architectural motivated and performance driven design. We've actually been working on um, a project in Toronto, a Renzo Piano project in Toronto, which um, uh, I'll leave it to Roman to describe the project um, uh, in, in a little while. Uh, but these are the uh, projects that uh, uh, Roman uh, is is going to be presenting in that relationship, which is over you know almost three years now that we've been working with Roman. It's been basically virtually in um, uh, in working with them and rarely in in the same room. So most of the design work that we've been doing with Roman is either Roman in New York um, uh, coming in virtually or coming in virtually from Stuttgart over those three years. But uh, the project is under construction. Um, it is over to Rome Scheiber uh, to do this presentation. Uh, Roman. Yeah, thank you very much, Silvio, for having me and for the kind introduction. I think we first met uh, like four years ago uh, and uh, yeah, you basically asked me to um, give an in-depth presentation about specialty facades, and here we are today. Um, so this will be a presentation about facades and engineering facades, not about myself or about our firm, just for those who don't know our firm. I have three slides. I make it very short um, just to put that into context. So as I said, we have three offices in Stuttgart, New York City, and in Berlin, actually in January, we uh, started uh, an office in Taipei, so there's a very small fourth one. So the office is getting 20 years old um, uh, this year. Um, we went to New York or on the North American market in 2009. Uh, what was a great decision looking looking back, it was a difficult time, the financial crisis, as we all know. And um, it's interesting projects over over there. We're about 75 people now. It's a good size for the things we do. Um, our firm is basically providing very traditional structural engineering services, solid structures, 
mass timber structures, things like that. We do facade consultation, very traditional curtain walling, but also specialty facades. This is what I'm going to focus on today. And what might be a bit special, we also do um, engineering services for facade contractors when it comes to very special components. So we are licensed engineers in North America, also in Canada and all states. And this is mostly more like um, yeah, grid shell structures, cable walls and things like that when the facade contractors need support on uh, things. And then there's always a couple of projects and things which don't perfectly fit into these three categories. We do tensile structures, some bridges here and there. Actually, we are quite fortunate and did some nice projects with uh, new materials. We worked with bioplastics, cold cast, ceramics. We built the first uh, concrete bridge without any steel, just with textile reinforcement and carbon fiber reinforcement. We do, do geometry programming, what is typically part of the facade work. But I think that's it for what we do. We're quite international. Um, there's still some gray zones in parts of the world. So Europe is, of course, an important market, but North America is uh, very interesting and important for us. The projects are better there and the architecture is not as conservative as in Europe sometimes. So that's why it's very interesting. These are the five projects I'm going to present right now. Starting with the first one, the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, a project uh, we did with Renzo Piano Building Workshop, in this case the Genoa office, Gensler is the local architect. Um, we started working on this one, I think in 2013. There's a master plan uh, in Los Angeles, there's the LACMA Museum, some of you may know the actual museum building, the Saban building or Mako building as it was called before, and this sphere building, what is what I'm basically talking about um, today. So it's part of a, of a larger development there. This is a section through the building. There, this is the big steel glass canopy uh, with a 45 meter diameter. There's uh, three bridges which are linking the, ex the, the existing building, which is not shown here on the right, with a new building. It's uh, one of, yeah, one of the bridges is suspended from the upper one. Also maybe worth to mention is that the new building is base isolated. There's a high, highly critical seismic zone. So in a seismic event, the building moves up to 1.6 meters, 1.6 meters horizontally. And the bridges, uh, they have some steel glass expansion joints. What is also quite, quite interesting. There's a big theater in the body, in the concrete body of, of the building. So this is just for context. Our yeah, scope of work basically included all steel glass parts, some canopies, also a few things in, in the building. Uh, that's another uh, section in here. Also interesting maybe to mention that there was a previous design on, on this project. There was a different design team working on it. There was even a contractor. There was even a mock-up on this project. They had some problems with it. They, the project was not in, in, in budget. There was some design issues which have not been resolved. So the entire team basically has been replaced, just not the design architect, of course. And we came on board and, and got a, a very special contract. Our scope of work really included everything from concept sketches to the final engineering, including the sign and sealed shop drawings for the project, what basically limited the role of the facade contractor in, in this case, made them more like a fabricator and installer. So maybe also for context, we have worked with RPPW on the uh, on a project in Cologne, which has some similarities, also a shell structure with some cable bracings. We did a number of other steel glass grid shell structures with very lightweight steel glass uh, structures. So we are quite familiar with these kind of structures. And this is during, you know, when you start approaching a project and you have early discussions, we had a very clear idea how we would approach this project. These are some of the initial uh, concept sketches. On the left, a concept sketch from RBBW. On the right, a sketch from ourselves, um, but basically showing the, in, the, the basic idea uh, of, of, this, of this project. We have some curved steel tube framing in one direction and very slender uh, secondary framing in the other direction. At the beginning, we started with some curved glass, what was replaced uh, for, with a shingled flat glass 
for um, various reasons, mainly architectural reasons, to be honest, some cable bracings. And here you also see how we translated that into a very first concept sketch with the first structural grid layer. We had some pins with a secondary uh, grid for the glazing structure. Um, and you know, you know the, yeah, the, the, the cable clamps and the cable layers uh, here with some tolerance adjustment. And so you see that in more detail later. So for engineers, maybe uh, interesting. It's a very highly, it's a highly efficient, very lightweight structure with 40 kilograms per square feet, square meter steel tonnage. What is is very lightweight. So we from from day one we basically said that the steel tubes will basically will not be uh, bigger than 100 millimeter diameter. So for a 45 meter span, 100 millimeter, this is quite uh, slender. In reality, it's it's even more. Uh, slim and filigree as it as it looks on the renderings, if you if you happen to to see it in 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 reality. So this is a 3D diagram of the glazing system here with a shingle system. It I think it becomes more structured. So this was also desired not to make it, you know, just a, like a, a full glass building, um, but yeah, to give it some more lines and structure on the glass layer. Let me talk a bit about the structural concept of the, the whole thing. So basically we have this steel grid, what is shown in, in red here. Of course, we need some vertical supports. What are basically, what is a combination of these um, blue struts here combined with some horizontal um, pins or members between the concrete body and the steel grid here. What is providing the vertical support and the lateral support to the shell structure. Then we have the, the, the bright gray cable bracing, what is making the steel grid a full shell structure. And then we had a, a couple of special features, we call it Shukov bracing, what I'm going to show later, towards uh, these big openings just to pro provide additional stability. So we had some global structural models just to give an impression, which are of course always a simplification of the reality. So there's members, you know, we had to apply some properties uh, like diameters, material properties, pretension force so to these to these members. We had the support conditions and yeah, we had first structural models, in this case starting on equator height and got a first idea how it behaves um, structurally speaking. Without going too far into detail, we had to play with the cable forces, get an idea um, what the what what pretension force in the cable is required under various load cases. Um, uh, the seismic is basically always the governing load case. It's always more critical. Even with these base isolators, it's the critical load case over wind loads. Um, we have uh, yeah wind forces, maximum stress on wind forces in the cables. We had stress plots and uh, and uh, deflection plots for the the, the framing members. A few diagrams here, utilization here, deflections towards the openings. Always the, the areas towards the openings are the critical ones. We had to run some detailed analysis of some um, yeah, details, um, interface details and, and connection details where we had to use different software ANSYS if uh, you're familiar with some of these uh, programs. And what is of course related to this very special scope we had what I mean, if we are facade consultants, it's more like doing a preliminary sign, throw it on the market, get a contractor, and you know this the, the game you you typically play. In this case, we had to design the embeds, and basically every single weld seam on this project was designed and engineered by our office. What is quite different in yeah most uh, most projects. So this is how deep we went into the design, um, basically before the contractors came on board or the the facade subcontractors came on board. These are some physical models uh, the architects built, and that was the first time we saw how small the details were. That's you, you basically cannot see it here on, on these pictures, but it's it's really tiny details, and we, we kind of got scared when we first saw it in reality <laughs> in in the office in in Genoa. So these are um, basically the S-built details of the glazing system. Um, there, there were some, I mean, minor changes through through the design phases. Basically, it's all still the same. We had to do some modifications. The, the deeper we went into the engineering, uh, was driven by by structure. We went to a, a D 
T profile, uh, the curved, we have curved steel tubes, but the lower edge of the secondary structure is basically curved, but the upper one is uh, polygonal because we have flat shingled glass. So we have these steps in the glazing system. This is an exploded view of the glazing system. You see uh, the cable clamps and the, the twin cables. Also, maybe worth to mention is that we have a hidden dead load support for the glass. The glass has a, is a stepped glazing, what you maybe can see here. And only the inner um, glass play of both glass panes is dead load supported. It means that the outer glass is basically just supported through the interlayer. So we used uh, a, a structural PVP interlayer, had to do some tests, what I'm going to show in a second, just to make this uh, invisible dead load support happen. There's, it, it looks like a sphere, and a sphere doesn't have uh, a lot of details, but actually there are a lot of details. So there's cable end details. It has also, it's also related to the pretensioning process of, of such details, where we had to think about how and where you can yeah, put the hydraulic jacks to apply the pretension force on the cables. Um, the embeds, they have a very complicated geometry. Every Basically every single embed has a different geometry, what had to be designed and engineered, or at least the, the most critical ones had to be uh, designed and engineered. Um, so that was uh, also quite interesting. By the way, the, the concrete body was not directly uh, part of our, our scope of work, but of course it was a very important interface and we had to contribute to, to, to this interface. So the um, yeah, maybe worth to mention the, the concrete shell are prefabricated concrete elements which had have been attached to a steel framing and the embeds have basically been attached to the steel framing and then there was they applied just some shotcrete from inside what was yeah basically then the, the, the full structural uh, makeup of, of, the, of the concrete body. And then the, this was the first part of the embeds and the second part of the embed with some leveling crowd just to adjust the tolerances. So that's embeds. Yeah, there's a couple of other details. Maybe I'm not going too far into detail. There's maintenance catwalks on the lower edge and uh, on a few other levels up to the, to the terrace level. Uh, what you can see here, the lower glass edge also has some there are very special details. Um, there was a maintenance there um, for yeah, just basically it's to get access to the apex of the sphere. But of course, this is also an important architectural feature. So RPPW called it Mohawk feature. So it's also yeah, a nice thing. So every detail has been designed and a lot of back and forth with a lot of um, care about detail. So it's not just a thing which was necessary for technical reasons, but yeah, it was nice to to go so far into detail together with the architects. It was also quite unique, I would say. Um, the bracings towards the ends, I mentioned that uh, a shell structure doesn't want to have straight cuts and openings. It was to, wants to, wants to be a complete shell structure, but we had these openings for some reasons. So we had some some uh, cables across. The, the, the sphere like cross section. So basically when you have some asymmetric forces like wind from the right or from the left, it gets distorted and pulls basically on the other side and stabilizes itself with these cables. So that was also part of the concept. A few things about testing. So we investigated in our structural models, like how does the steel grid distort under various load cases. As mentioned before, seismic was always the most critical load case. We found that um, between four um, um, nodes, the maximum displacement was 22.3 millimeters, what is quite something compared to the small glazing details we had. So the rhombic, so, so the rhombic distortion um, was basically critical. So this is our two little diagrams just showing what is meant with rhombic distortion. So the glass panes, they are basically rotating relative to the steel grid and could basically clash and so. So we had to analyze, analyze that. Then of course we um, 
so first we got the first main contractor. The, the first main contractor was replaced by the second main contractor. Then we got a facade contractor, what was uh, Gartner from Germany. Um, and they got involved with all these testings and mock-ups. So this is a first very small scale mock-up we build. It's a racking mock-up. It's purely basically made just to simulate these um, deformations of the steel grid. So it's basically as built details um, on a little secondary steel grid, which can be distorted with hydraulic jacks. And we just distorted it uh, for the same amount as predicted in our structural models and even went further up to a certain degree and just checked if something happens um, with, a, with the glass panes. But we, are, we were lucky and we could distort it by far more than predicted. This is, by the way, this is always the case. You can distort glass panes or facade systems always much more than in theory before something happens. Um, keep that in mind. So another thing was um, it was partially the city of Los Angeles, partially ourselves as the engineer of record. We wanted to design the, st the steel glass canopy up to a rel relatively high safety standard. So we basically agreed to design it like a walkable glass surface. There's an ASTM code which is more or less giving the load. So basically we said that there's um, if it should still carry a maintenance worker if one glass pane is basically broken. This is, you know, the condition when someone drops a hammer or something, one piece of glass breaks, it should still be able to support a maintenance worker under a relatively high uh, temperature of, of 60 degrees Celsius. So this is what we simulated in the structural model, but we also did a test to verify that it doesn't look very spectacular, but it's basically just two glass panes with, with a glass shingle, some styroform, some heaters, and a lot of weight. So we had these 300 pounds, what is basically, I think, just the line up to the middle of this little uh, tower. And uh, then we destroyed the first glass pane. We passed the test. We destroyed the second glass pane. We passed, yeah, we have passed the test. So it, nothing really happened. So we added more weights until we couldn't find any more of the weights. And yeah, you know, until the, the weights basically fell over and crashed into the glass. So that was not part of the test, but you can see that, you know, they didn't fall through. It's quite interesting to see that glass is has a very high redundancy, uh, especially when you work with a, such a structural PVB inner layer like like this one. It was good to see and gave some confidence to all parties involved. We had to do some tests on these cable clamps because uh, the friction between um, the um, the, the, the cable and the cable clamps was very important. So we had to make some assumptions based on other projects in our experience. We had to make some early assumptions what these cable clamps can take, what the maximum pretension force could be. Uh, we had to run some, yeah, some calculations uh, with this, but only when we did the test, we knew what we can really um, take in, uh, or apply to the, to the cables in, in terms of pretension force. Um, we it, it was a bit uh, it, what it was a bit strange that we had a relatively high spread in the results. Um, so we added in a few locations with the highest loads, we added little cable clamps behind the main cable clamps just to just to be safe. But that was also quite important. Of course, we built a visual mock-up um, where we saw the the actual details in full scale for the first time. Yeah, geometry was also quite important. We we have handed over geometry data to the facade contractor in form of 3D models, but also coordinate lists and section section through every single uh, of these um, grid lines. And this is more like a legend that, you know, there's always uh, a set of geometry data on the concrete line on the structural uh, on the on the primary uh, grid and on the glazing uh, grid line. Fabrication. Um, basically, the entire steel grid has been prefabricated in the factory. That was done by Signum Steel, what was a supplier to Gartner. They fabricated the steel for, for them. Interestingly, there was not a single millimeter tolerance adjustment over the entire steel grid from the left to the right. There's no tolerance adjustment because it's a 
it's a, a shell structure which basically doesn't allow for movement joints. So it has to be adjusted basically at the pins between the concrete and the, and the steel grid. So this was a test if everything fits together, but you can basically very well test that with templates and so if the geometry fits. And then it has been dismantled in segments and uh, paint has been applied, of course. And this is always like prefabricated units, what has been shipped uh, to, to the US. We had an intense uh, uh, collaboration and uh, cooperation with, with Gartner about everything related to installation because we had to agree where are the, the joints between the segments because only we, we, we had the structural model, so we knew we basically knew what are the bending moments at each location. So we have agreed what are prefabricating, prefabricated units. We had to engineer the details at certain locations um, because here we have a few bolted connections where these prefab units uh, meet and had to en uh, engineer these pre-stressed bolt connections. So these are some typical details where the prefab units are coming together, some handholds, pre-stressed bolts are coming in here, some special tools where you can tighten uh, the bolts. So this is how it worked. What I uh, basically described a bit before, these are the embeds, the first set of embeds, the second part, uh, the leveling crowd in between. Uh, so this is also installation sequences. So this is obviously Los Angeles, blue sky and palm trees. Uh, things arrived on site and installation started um, uh, on the equator height or below equator first on around all around the building. As you can see here, there's always like these um, kind of ladder segments and a gap in between. So these ladders have been installed first. The pieces in between have been installed in a second step. And then basically the upper part has been installed with a full uh, scaffold. So this is a nice picture where uh, you can't really see that the lower part is already installed. The upper part is still growing from the apex downwards. And then the magic happened where, you know, the, the upper part and the lower part uh, should uh, fit together. And su surprisingly, it, it worked out very well. Um, I should maybe mention that the geometry itself was very precise. The issue was more that in the morning when the sun, the sun hits the building from the right, it heats up and it, it can fit well in the morning, but in the afternoon it doesn't fit anymore. Things like that just happen. And this also had to be taken into account uh, during these discussions for the installation concept. One of the most complicated things on this project, and this is very unique and it's it's a science it's science on its own is pre-tensioning such a structure the entire steel grid still has been on the scaffold the scaffold i mean when when the steel grid is on the scaffold you can basically precisely control the the geometry of each node there was survey was was on site basically every day it was a very important part of the project then you start um, applying the cables um, in the first layer, from the left to the right, the cables from uh, in the opposite direction, and they had to be in. So the first, you have the cables in a loose condition, and then you have to start applying the pretension force in an absolutely symmetric way. If you, sorry, it was my mistake. If you apply the pretension force in an asymmetric way, if you pull too much on the left but not on the right, you would immediately distort the entire structure. So that was. Uh, very important. We always had to control um, the forces in each cable. We had to simulate every single step in this in this process. And we uh, even within one cable, the pretension force changes from node to node, um, and we knew these forces in the cables. So then um, this we we basically had have uh, pretensioned the entire um, the cables on the grid. And then it was still on the scaffold. This is this, uh, the geometry data on the uh, on on the grid on the on the scaffold. Then uh, the scaffold was released with a pretension on the cables, and then the the structure was basically sagging down. I think the 
the deepest sagging or deflection was, was 2.75 inches um, deflection towards the end. And we had predicted 3.0 inches deflection. So it was a quarter inch uh, off from our from what we predicted, what the structure um, deflected after releasing from the scaffold. So that was very, very close. So um, a big step towards. So now we had a, a structural grid shell which was spanning free. The scaffold was still there, but uh, you know, released by 10 centimeters or something. So the glass was fabricated in Austria. It's Guardian glass fabricated by Eckelt. Looks simple from first sight, but actually we have some rounded corners. We have inclined glass edges, uh, structural PVP into layers. And here it's uh, a similar story than uh, what I said before with the with the application of the pretension force, the installation of glass had been done in a very symmetric way, starting at the apex going down downwards basically in circles. The glass is twice as heavy as the steel structure. This is also um, quite uh, quite interesting, I, I would say. And um, that's the, the top right one. There's a picture when I was on site and when they started installing the, the first glass panes, I think they, they have just done, I don't know, the, the first couple of square meters of glass. And I found a couple of cables which were just slack, and I was really scared because um, you know it, it was like yeah something is is going to fail. It's not a, a shell structure anymore. But uh, looking back into our structural model, uh, it was basically what we predicted because when you have asymmetric forces, it just can happen that it distorts. Some cables got slack, and they just continued with installation, and the cable got tensioned uh, again. And here, maybe you can also see the dead, little hidden dead load support on the glass shingle. Um, yeah, we had operable vents. There was comfort studies uh, done by Transolar climate engineers. Um, there was also a concern that it overheats in summer, but um, that was uh, basically solved quite quite okay. Um, we had long discussions about what kind of shades should be integrated. Uh, there would be a separate lecture, I guess. We had many interesting ideas. In the end, we ended up with roller shades by Draper, and um, they basically just followed the grid. There's some, or there's a lot of challenges with, reg with regards to geometry, uh, because we, you have offsets in in the shell structure. That's a, a little mock-up, shading mock-up by Draper. These are yeah, the rollers hung from the roof structure and uh, it's in closed condition. Here you see these bracing cables. They look slack, but actually they are not really tensioned. They only get tensioned in case there's asymmetric forces on on the on the dome. And these are basically pictures of the completed building that was April last year. It's almost a year ago. And uh, the grand opening is supposed to happen in September this year. So that was the first one. Silvio, uh, am I still in, in time? Should I speed up? <laughs> I'm too slow, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah just speed up a little. <laughs> OK, good. So <laughs> good. Uh, the next, next, one, next one is uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. That's a project we did with uh, Stephen Hall Architects. Kendall Heaton is the executive architect. Um, actually, it consists of two projects. It's the so-called Glassell School. It's the uh, Nancy and Rich Kinner building, what is the, the new exhibition hall. And it's a phase one, a phase two, and there's an existing building, a Mies van der Rohe building uh, right next to it. So there's a there's also a big master plan. The, the new building was the new exhibition building was built on a former car park, and that's why the first uh, the Glassell School had been built before because the the underground car park has been built, and you know there was a couple of things um, going on step by step by step. These are initial sketches by Stephen Hall showing the initial idea. There's a sculpture garden, what is pretty nice. And uh, a sloped roof for these for the Glassell School, and this is the Kinder Building, with uh, yeah the 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 actual 
museum building with some galleries divided by these courtyards. But I'm first going to talk about the Glossel School. So this is how it, uh, the final result looks like. It was completed in May 2018. It's a uh, yeah, big punched windows with precast concrete panels and a couple of uh, other things. These are early physical models um, with, yeah, I think the, the architectural concept can be very well seen here. Initial watercolors from Stephen um, with his, yeah, the materiality and, and you know, the, the concept is, is very obvious. Some renders from inside. Um, yeah, no, for us, the challenge was clear from, from the beginning, big glass, concrete, no details. So, um, yeah, these, these, uh, punched windows, they are actually pretty, pretty large in size. They have uh, a maximum size of three by six meters by 3.2 meters, uh, is, is the maximum glass size. What we, what we made sure that uh, they don't exceed this size for, uh, technical and economic reasons, and the biggest window size is 10 by 5 meters. And uh, as as you probably know, I mean, Houston is located uh, close to the Gulf of Mexico with hurricane loads, and we have wind loads of uh, I think 130 psf, what is 5.7 kilonewton uh, here, 120 psf, 5.7 kilonewton per square meter, what is just in insane um, for compared to what we have in, in Europe or other parts in uh, in North America. So in schematic design, this, this, that's a bit the story how we came to the final result. I mean, in schematic design, we, we started with, with a structural concrete layer and some precast concrete uh, outside and some thermal insulation inside. We knew that this is quite ambitious and um, Houston has a, a very basically almost the entire year it's it's hot and warm and thermal insulation is, is not such a huge issue it's not required by code but we wanted to have a yeah a very sustainable building we have had trans solar uh, on board they were also pushing for a good thermal performance so we started with these two layer uh, concrete approach and insulation inside what is very common in in Europe but not very common in North America, uh, I would say. So um, yeah, the day has come when costs are on the table and we had to find some savings. So we switched the system basically to just the concrete outside and some insulation inside. So we were running some thermal calculations and basically could show that not having, yeah, having any insulation on the concrete slabs, uh, basically between, yeah, on, on the slab height, is at least not an issue for a condensation. It's more an issue uh, if you have condensation outside than, than inside in, in Houston. But it, it at least there was a technical solution for it. In, so in design development phase, we had a, a kind of approach with some custom aluminum profile and some glass panes with a little uh, carrier frame behind. And we're attaching the glass to these frames from here. And this is pretty much what we ended up with in, in the end. So there was some cast in place concrete slabs, some precast concrete panels in between, and these big translucent glass panes with translucent PVP and acid etched glass surface. We had some operable ones as well, and different shapes and geometry. These are basically the S build details, relatively simple uh, details, I would say. Um, so it's the challenge was more um, dealing with geometry and tolerances and, th and things like that. We got a f um, more basically a local facade contractor, Admiral Glass. McCarthy was the main contractor. And um, yeah, there was a quite good collaboration between all parties uh, involved. So this is what we ended up with. A relatively big challenge was these transoms uh, on half height um, because you know the upper glass pane has been supported somewhere. Um, we had some split transoms with two half extrusions and some steel bars in between. So it's basically the steel bars which are taking the horizontal loads and it's more like aluminum cladding around, around them. Um, also worth to mention is that the upper glass pane is basically supported through the transom by the lower glass pane. Otherwise, we would have had much thicker transoms. So parts of the loads are going to the embeds uh, on the left and on the right, but parts of the loads are going to the lower glass pane. 
uh, otherwise no chance to uh, do such slender details. Uh, what you don't see from first sight, we have many different inclinations in, in geometry. So we have 37 uh, special extrusions just for the various conditions on, on this project that was agreed together with a contractor that was cheaper than, you know, customizing all the details. Uh, so it was an economic solution in the end of the day. Operable vents um, have been integrated and we had a pretty big vestibule, 9.4 meters. It looks small, but actually it's it's really big. Uh, and uh, we worked on that one as well for quite a while. We had some steel mullions here because aluminum, there's no chance for, for that size to load bearing glass walls supporting the canopies and also some funny details. Yeah, canopies supporting through the glass. Uh, by the facade mullion and things like that, but let's make that quick. Um, concrete selection was quite interesting. There was a combination of cast in place and precast concrete panels, and there was a lot of discussion. This was mostly by by uh, Stephen Hall's office, of course. We were more in the background here, but you know that the precast and the cast in place concrete that they fit nicely together, combined with the glass uh, next next to them. We build a performance mock-up or a combine it's a combined visual and performance mock-up where for the first time we we saw everything in in full full scale and uh, this was actually one of the biggest challenges uh, here we have these i said five by ten meter large um, punched windows but we only have a 12 millimeter joint between concrete and facade and if you're familiar with concrete tolerances uh, you will you will immediately notice that this uh, is basically a problem, and um, so I, I will come back to that in a second. But the super small joints and non-visible details was was a challenge. We did some air water tests, um, first construction images of these precast concrete panels. It's a bit like Lego, actually. <laughs> there was you know these steel bars and tolerance adjustment with some. Um, shims underneath, so that was relatively th simple. It's al also interesting because they have been fabricated very, very precisely and positioned also quite precisely. That was um, a very good job uh, done by the main contractor and their suppliers. This is actually the most interesting picture, um, I, I would almost say, because for all these punched windows, templates have been fabricated. Um, this is just aluminum bars. They have been put into the holes with these templates. They went to the factory at Admiral Glass and started fabricating the actual facade units. And only with these geometry data and these field measured uh, units, it was possible to realize the, the glass facade with such slim um, joints between the punched windows and the concrete. The glass was coming from Mexico, from Crista Cuba, Guadalajara. And this is the famous first glass panes with <laughs> glass pane at uh, yeah at the, at the bottom. Uh, there were some we had some fights uh, with them. They promised that they can deliver the glass, but they are fabricating on five thousand feet altitude and they cannot pressure equalize the IGU. So we had to put some capillary tubes into the IGU. And by putting these these tubes in, we lost the argon gas in the glass. Then we didn't have the thermal performance. We, re we needed, um, yeah, that was not easy. Fabrication was, yeah, was okay. Let's let's put it that way. <laughs> Transportation of the units, a bit, a bit wild. Installation, um, yeah, this is just how it went up. Um, as we didn't do a full dynamic uh, PMU test, uh, we, we did some dynamic tests on the actual building. What we all typically don't do uh, on projects, it's more like the AMA hose nozzle water spray tests, what we do to confirm the water tightness. Um, so it's mainly to check the interfaces between concrete and glass. So this is, yeah, the S build project. There was also some nice art pieces um, right, right next to it. And here you can see the tower cranes from the actual exhibition uh, building. Uh, what I'm going to show next. These are some of the classrooms, a lot of transparent glass in here. 
it's very nice shadow free light in the in the building at night it starts to glow it's really nice so uh, the nancy and rich kinder building this is uh, more or less just not even across the street but just uh, on the same campus here this is uh, was completed uh, just three months ago so it's really brand new you can say this is one of the first initial physical models done by Stephen Hall's office. Um, in plan, I think this is the, the ground level. There's a cafe, but basically, you know, the volume is divided by these courtyards and you have these galleries with yeah, the, the different exhibitions uh, in there. One of the very, in, very first uh, sketches done by us and the first physical model done by Stephen Hall's office you have uh, load bearing concrete walls, some punched windows behind them and these translucent glass tubes. And uh, our it was clear that we will have some maintenance catwalks and some be between the glass tubes and the, the concrete. They are spanning up to 21 feet. It's a bit more than six meters. Um, and um, yeah, this is this is how the whole discussion about that started. So from the climate engineer, we we had also a, a close collaboration with them. It's not only an architectural uh, feature at diffusing the light and then making the building glow at, at night, but it also reduces significantly the solar heat gains from 900 100 watts to 250 just by ventilating away the, the heat which is absorbed by the, uh, by the glass tube. So it was also call, called cold jacket. So overall, um, the due to the to the glass tube facade, the energy consumption was reduced by 43%. So again, it's not just a nice architectural feature, but it's also um, a quite nice, um, uh, a sustainable con part of a nice uh, con sustainable concept. So we started very early to talk about materiality of the building. So we uh, ordered uh, early samples, translucent glass, acid etched glass, um, compared different interlayers, early bending tests on the glass. Building like that has not been built before, so we had to do some tests. We tested some low E coatings, if they could be uh, bent. We, we found what we basically expected, that it makes the glass stiff and it's not a, a very good idea. Uh, that was the first, uh, not a full visual mock-up, but more like a glass tube mock-up, what you don't see from first sight. That's, these are glass tubes with different diameters partially different glass makeup and different interlayers. So in, in full scale, see, see the glass mock-up uh, in, yeah, see the glass mock-up in, in, in full scale and make a material selection. So we have an acid etched outer surface to a pair of, of glass panes, which have been gravity bent um, by a Chinese firm, Shenani in, in, uh, in Shenzhen, and four layers of translucent PVP from Venshiva. Uh, early glass analysis, uh, where we learned very quickly that the glass tubes should have a hinged connection. We also learned that there will be some tension zones and compression zones, and there's a lot of more like dead material in between. Um, we did some bending tests on the glass tubes. We had to compare the results from the bending tests with the structural calculations. Um, we, we did and compared the results, what was a bit tricky because you cannot directly translate the forces you find here with the stresses you find in, in your structural pl plots, but might be a, a different story. Um, we measured temperatures uh, on the glass tubes for almost six months. So we had a lot of um, yeah, yeah, measurement points on the glass tubes and yeah, just tracked what, uh, you know, the, the background is if the sun hits the glass tubes uh, from a, a steep angle, they can heat up on the left, but stay cold on the right, and there can be internal stresses. So with this test, we uh, found these temperatures, which have been fed into the structural calculations. A full mock-up has been built by Gartner. We got the same contractor uh, again then uh, on the Academy Museum. And uh, these are 3D details we developed and these are pretty much the pretty much the as built details what you can see here um, with some nice hinge details some hidden aluminum clips which are glued to the to the glass tubes some dead load supports at the base 
and uh, these are yeah these are the as built details so aluminum extrusions glued to the glass tubes little dead load uh, chairs and uh, a little uh, thread where you can turn up and down the glass tubes for tolerance adjustment and the uh, maintenance catwalks behind this is a picture still from the mock-up but this is uh, as built details and some lighting here lighting designer was also involved this is china shenzhen we had a trip there with the ownership and uh, a couple of, of people and was also interesting to see how they did the glass tubes it's gravity bending method each uh, pair of glass panes needs eight hours in the bending oven it's a super slow process but i think i'm running out of time i have have speed up have to speed up right <laughs> so the first Glass tube has been installed here, and then you know it, it went quicker and quicker with with the time. Substructure glass tubes went on. A nice corner detail where the light is shining through lower edge, um, where the 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 air can flow through. We had some. We had to protect the upper edges because we have been scared a bit of hailstorms if they are hitting the glass edge that they are destroying um, the glass tubes. Then um, a daylight mock-up has been built uh, in it's a half-scale mock-up. Um, you know, it's 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 a museum. It's with fine arts pieces uh, in there. There was a daylight analysis and the half-scale mock-up. They uh, has yeah has been built and the, the results have been compared. And surprisingly, we found that there's significantly more light in the daylighting mock-up compared to the values predicted in uh, the simulations. So the glass uh, makeup had to be adjusted slightly. These are this is um, construction of the galleries um, before the glass and the ceilings and everything went in. This is a physical model, picture of the physical model. This is actually the final result before the art pieces and stuff was going in. So this is how the museum looks like basically right now, just with some more art in there. People. It's a very nice space. A lot of, yeah, it's it's a nice, extremely nice atmosphere. Yeah, we had a, a frameless glass and other wall types and canopies and things like that, but maybe not, not going to explain more detail. Translucent glass, transparent glass tubes combined with translucent ones. Um, the, it's also interesting to see how the appearance changes, uh, yeah, during the day. With the warm light, they look completely different than when it's getting dark, and you know it, it starts to shine through the glass tube, uh, glass tubes from from inside. And uh, I think that's it. A few last images at the the main entrance. There's some, yeah, nice nice plants and and things like that. I think that's. That was that was uh, the third one. So the next one is the Harvard Science and Engineering Complex. So um, that's a building we did with Danish architects for Harvard University, and uh, it's a pretty pretty big um, lab building, a lot of wall types, um, and uh, we, I'm mainly going to talk about uh, the main facade, which is. Basically, uh, yeah, this one with a with a shading screen in front of the curtain wall. Um, the basic idea was that to block as much daylight or undesired uh, daylight as possible while allowing diffuse light and indirect light to go uh, in the building. So um, there was also a climate engineer involved, and they um, wanted to make this um, the most sustainable building of, of all Harvard. Um, of all buildings from Harvard University, and part of part of this um, concept was actually this shading screen. Uh, so we also simulated in the summer months the heat gain was reduced by this shading screen by 55 percent. And I will make this one very short, otherwise I'm running out of time. This is a very simple calculation that um, basically you are saving CO2 by adding. Uh, these shading features because you're reducing the cooling loads, uh, but by adding material in front of the curtain wall, you're you're adding like gray energy, steel and stuff. So if you compare the energy you are saving 
and uh, the material you are using in a, using in addition in addition to the curtain wall, um, you can you can compare that. But what we found is basically that um, the pink line is basically what is needed for additional energy and or CO2 to build the screen, and the 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 green line is basically what we are going to save during the lifetime of the building by the shading screen. If we have a constant energy mix, or if we are saying that the energy mix is getting greener or greener. So just um, a little check that the concept basically does make sense, right? So um, I will make it short. We have a, a curtain wall. Interestingly, this is not an aluminum curtain wall, but it's a steel curtain wall. We have a shading screen, what consists of tension rods, some pins between the screen and the curtain wall. Um, the actual shade panels are made out of hydroformed thin stainless steel panels, 1.2 millimeters formed stainless steel. Um, um, what is the idea behind behind that was that if we have just a piece of metal and it's getting loaded, it deflects. If we start forming it, it gets stiff and therefore it gets stable. Or in other words, you can also reduce the material thickness or reduce the carbon footprint by it. So yeah, we this was done by by uh, by Benish. In that case, the final geometry data of these panels uh, have been developed um, for handover to the specialty fabricator. What was uh, um, Edelstahl Mechanik from southern Germany? These are actually the molds. This is solid steel milled out of solid steel, where just a liquid is pressing the material into the molds. This is basically what comes out of the mold, the raw material after pressing. Then this is a laser cutter which is cutting the panels out of um, the uh, out of the the base sheets. The panels have been bead blasted to get a nice finish, and this is uh, yeah basically the result after bead blasting. Uh, part of the quality control, they had a, a tool where they just compared the as built geometry with a theoretical geometry and just to find um, deviations between the, uh, the, the the geometry it, it should have. This is before uh, before shipping, packing the panels. Uh, yeah, this is still a mock-up picture. Uh, yeah, I mean, before I show some installation pictures, of course, we had to do engineering on that one as well. We have discussed the pretension force a lot of uh, of these tension rods we also did some vibration analysis of of the uh, of of the tension rods the story is a bit that nobody really could predict how it starts to swing our structural model predicted a certain eigenfrequency but we made a, a mock up and found that the the lowest eigenfrequency was at 3.7 hertz and basically a high frequency is better than a lower one we predicted it at 2.1 so it was good that the result was higher than predicted. So it was not really sensitive to start swinging in the wind. We did an, there's an acoustic wind tunnel in Stuttgart where we also did some tests because we were a bit scared or the owner was scared that it starts like, uh, yeah, making noise like a big organ in, a, in, a, in the wind. So we also checked that and yeah, would also be a separate story that with different perforation of, of these panels under different wind speeds. Uh, there was some checks and also we, we learned a few things, but to make it short, it was basically not critical. Um, and there was no strange whistling or things like that. So the actual construction or installation of the facades, uh, as said, it's not a traditional curtain wall, but it's a semi-unitized steel facade means that it's it's like a stick built steel facade but prefabricated over several stories with the gaskets and everything already on um, in a second step um, yeah, the glass has been installed before the shading screen was installed this is a pre-construction meeting where you can see this is just one of these springs which is necessary to apply the pretension force and basically keep the pretension force on a on a certain level and uh, also interesting, this little timber block is to control how far they have to pull the rods to get the, the right uh, pretension into the rods. And for certain temperatures they, on, on site, they have to use different timber blocks. That was an idea um, the facade contractor developed uh, during 
construction. Yeah, installation, this is how the panels got up. It's quite transparent on this elevation, a bit more opaque on, on this one. And the beauty shots will still be made in the very near future. It's not completely, I think the client partially moved in, but it's not completely uh, opened uh, to public yet. I think that's it. Now the last one. So today, today I learned that uh, the last project is not called Toronto Courthouse, but it's actually called Ontario Court of Justice slash Toronto. So this is the official name of the project I'm going to uh, present right now. This is actually, uh, yeah, as mentioned at the beginning, the project where we first collaborated with NOR and of course with Renzo Piano's Paris office. And uh, this was a design build competition together with Alliston and the owner is Infrastructure Ontario. So um, 10 minutes is not much. I just wanted to mention that the project didn't look like the end result from the very beginning. We started in the competition phase actually with a curtain wall with some terracotta features. And uh, we had some, uh, yeah, also some geometry optimized elements in front of the curtain wall. Which, uh, so which were supposed to block some of the daylight. So this is how we started. We also found that terracotta wants to be extruded or it wants to be pressed. And there was also a process where we said, OK, we can do it, but you know, we rather need linear elements. We need node elements. And this is how step-by-step uh, step we basically had a solution. But at the same time, it was very clear that it's, it, it's, a, it's a certain effort and it's not inexpensive to do such a facade. And uh, a decision was made that we will go in a different direction. So, and obviously it was the right decision because we won the, the competition and and uh, won the project, yeah. So um, these are just some pictures saying that there was a previous design and this would have been also a nice project, but this was not further pursued. So we ended up with something else. We have a number of wall types, not going to present all of them, in detail, trying to keep it on a high level. We have the main tower facade, which is a curtain wall system, which consists of vision glazing and, and uh, opaque elements. With what are these um, quite special uh, shadow box elements? Um, these are 3D diagrams where you can see uh, that the, uh, yeah, the, the vision part is relatively clear. The opaque part consists of these deep drawn metal panels um, what is also yeah, i'm going to show that in a second uh, it's a piece of a piece of glass and these deep drawn metal behind them just to create some more depth depth and uh, it's also part of the architectural concept we used a, a very similar or basically the same method than on the the harvard project just a different supplier this is a specialty supplier called felitz from ingolstadt and uh, these were the first mock-ups they, they fabricated um, for these uh, panels behind the, the glass. Um, yeah, just to give you an idea, these are our curtain wall details. If you're familiar with curtain wall details, they often look slightly different. It was very important and there was a lot of discussions uh, with the entire team that, you know, that the upper part of the transom and the lower part of be, be, be above and below the stack has the same elevation. Everything is symmetric. So there was a lot of architectural effort, similar than on the Academy Museum. This is what I like about RPPW. They spend a lot of time designing it um, to a perfect level. Not say, okay, it works, but it must be beautiful and it must work. <laughs> so um, a lot of special corners, um, like uh, we, it was called peel off facade or negative angle facade, just a few of them where the actual or flyby facade, you can also call them where the actual curtain wall basically ends. There's a little, little extension of the glass and uh, these special also deep drawn um, metal panels are yeah, basically folding inwards in a way. Yeah, some of some of these details just to give an impression. We got uh, Entermax as the facade subcontractor. They joined relatively early on this project and we got more like a review role um, when they came on board, what was okay. 
Um, there's a mast feature, as you may uh, know, in front of the so-called feature facade. There's, a, I think, a roughly 90 meter tall carbon fiber mast, which is not standing on the ground, but is in front of the curtain wall, which is tied back to the to the curtain wall at some points and also vertically supported uh, through it, which changes its diameter from the base to the middle and uh, decreases its diameter uh, once again. So this was one of the initial uh, concepts. And of course, there are some challenges. If this is getting loaded and there's getting forces or movements into the curtain fault mullions, there's a risk of glass breakage. So we had to think about how to over overcome that. These were some of the initial concept sketches. First of all, we thought that we should basically link the, you know, the kind of we together just to avoid any movement and any loading getting into the curtain wall mullion. And these special bracket details, which are basically taking the loads. It's slightly different in, in the end, but the, the concept is still kind of kind of similar. And at the same time, it has to be aligned with, you know, there's a certain grid and transoms are on a certain certain height. Uh, very first concept sketches, it's a bit different in, in the end, but we had to think about how to break down these uh, these pieces. Is it cast iron? Is it welded? And, and so on, th three-dimensional uh, details and also the vertical supports. The mast cannot come in a single piece, but it will finally come in three pieces. I think these are the final dimensions. It's a specialty supplier for, I think, sailboat masts somewhere from North America. I forgot the name, sorry. But it's a, a central piece and it's two other pieces for the upper and the lower part which tapers from here to there, and it's around 90 meters. So the podium facade is a stick-built facade which and, and a series of canopies, initial concept sketches, and it's a special T-shaped aluminum stick-built facade with some steel reinforcement in there. And yeah, you know, these canopies, but maybe let's skip that otherwise i'm getting in trouble with silvio so <laughs> the atrium maybe this is the last and also the most challenging facade on on this project this is this part here and we had the atrium since day one of of the competition this was part of the project and this is where we also to be honest spent most time on um it's four stories tall uh and relatively large glass panes so it's and it has a 90 degree corner as you can if, if, as you have seen i'm sorry that i don't have better sketches than these two ones but th th that's that's actually the first sketches we made about uh, uh, about the atrium when you do cable walls you can basically just work with vertical cables then the cables are taking the horizontal loads and the horizontal uh, forces or if you have a corner the pros is transparency and and so on uh, but the big challenge is actually the corner what you will understand better probably on the on the next slide or you do a combination of vertical um, uh, cables and horizontal transoms uh, these were our yeah we, we started doing very simple structural models refined them later applied uh, pretension force to the to the cables increasing towards the corner for some reasons and here you 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 i think you can understand how a cable wall with a corner behaves in many many cases uh with cable walls having a 90 degree corner they just put put a big tree cord truss or something in the corner and solve the problem by that but this was not an option here so if there was no link with horizontal members at the corner and you get a wind load on this surface or a wind suction it would just the, the, both both surfaces would just gap and it would would not work. So these are basically more linking elements than transoms, these um, the horizontals. So it's also early phase of the competition. We thought about what what could these horizontals be? Is it T profiles, little Virendale trusses or cable braced uh, things? Very, very diagrammatic uh, little um, 3D models, initial concept sketches of uh, what that could be. We basically always started with everything, with the IGU outside and the cables and the trusses inside. This is how we started for a certain time. This was basically the solution, two cables inside and a, a kind of uh, Fear and Dale truss um, horizontally inside. 
um, but it was also still in the middle of the competition. Then at a certain point, uh, we got these sketches from RPBW where they started, uh, or they were basically, they had a desire to make it more symmetric um, with one, oops, sorry, with one cable inside, one cable outside. And so it's we, we further developed these uh, these systems. We started working with twin cables, uh, refined our structural models. We uh, looked further into these transom details. And um, uh, for some reasons, we had to um, mechanically reinforce the IGUs that they're not falling out of uh, the, the, the the details under certain uh, conditions. So these are very first concepts we discussed with the team. This is more like a, actually more like a stick build facade uh, connected to some to some cables where we had some mechanical connection of the glass to the transoms. This is a different approach, more like like a very tiny unitized approach, but with a mechanical fixation. The, the glass is basically glued to a, an aluminum piece and the aluminum piece is mechanically fixed to the steel structure. This was another approach, but I always had a, a bit of a concern with regards to water tightness because this is uh, doesn't doesn't feel too safe, to be honest. So I, from a mechanical point of view or a technical point of view, structural point of view, it was good, but water tightness was not too good. So yeah, it's it went a bit in a different direction. So these are other early sketches uh, where more more of the full elevation uh, running over their full height, these cable clamps, uh, which have been developed up to a certain degree. We had to look into the glass analysis. We had the linear supports uh, on, on the horizontal edges of the glass, and we had intermediate supports uh, on in the middle of, of the glass panes. Also quite important on glass facades is also the out of plane distortion, the warping of the glass panes. The glass is, is, is like a, a big piece of fabric under wind or other conditions. And we found that uh, the worst case glass pane has a 38 millimeter out of plane deformation. What is L over 36? What is an issue, to be honest? And it's not a technical issue or structural issue, but it's a warranty issue because you have to find a glass supplier who is giving a, a warranty on a short time uh, deflection uh, of, of that much. Um, that, that's always critical. It's not really, yeah. So you, you must find the right partners. And finally, we got Freinan Reifer as a subcontractor and they found the, the right glass supplier. These are 3D diagrams we prepared um, with close to the final result, but here we had some different details for architectural reasons. They further de uh, developed basically to these details. This is um, basically what the facade looks like in the very end. And we have some exploded views with the IGUs being glued to some stainless steel bars here. And these stainless steel bars are mechanically screwed into the horizontal uh, steel transoms just to reinforce the, the class mechanically. And yeah, these are the final final shop drawings. Actually, these there was there were some changes. Also, part of the story that there were some changes. These these were our final drawings. We were struggling a bit with, you know, how to apply the the, the pre tensioning on the on the cables. We always wanted to push down the lower detail towards the structural concrete. And uh, when we had the subcontracts on board, there was a change which was made as a team, um, just to pull through basically the rods through the slab and basically tension them from there. What is a nice solution? And you don't see uh, the four cats and, and things there was a good idea. Other people also have good ideas sometimes. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, interface details. Uh, I talked about the main detail. There was uh, an interface between the cable wall and the, the podium facade. What is uh, a super tricky detail? I don't know how many meetings just we had for, for these details where you know the cable wall is spanning and is deflecting and the, all the loads has to have been transferred and the adjacent walls but yeah so this this was a tricky one and uh, was also quite yeah time intensive to solve also maybe worth to mention we have uh, lamin a lot of laminated glass it's partially for um yeah it has different reasons but uh, one reason was that 
the hope was to improve the flatness of the glass and to improve also the safety uh, the, the safety level of the building in case a piece of glass breaks for some reason that nothing is falling out of out of the building and um, so this is what we had the glass is actually coming from poland from press glass um, it's a, a relatively young firm but they have uh, amazing technical equipment um, glass viewing meeting in in poland from inside from outside it's actually a super foggy day there was not too much to see but yeah that's yeah and there was a visual mock-up at antimax with uh, di two different wall types a corner condition here and uh yeah nice blue sky and the first time we saw these details this is actually a picture from the performance mock-up of this flyby facade or however you you want to call it and a few pictures uh, of I think they're a few weeks old now of the main curtain wall and here you see how the atrium facade is uh, now going up. Last two images that's a nice uh, detail and I didn't want to end my presentation with a detail but with people. I was actually searching for a detail of you Silvio with a pen or something but I only found pictures of you with wine pizza and pasta. But that's that's okay. But what I what I wanted to say is that you know you can, as an engineer you can you can have good ideas or you you can calculate things well. But in the end of the day, you need uh, a good team and people who are open for collaboration. And there were so many amazing people on this project. Uh, and uh, so that it's it's all about people in the end of the day. And I think uh, some of the people uh, are on the call today. So if there's a Q and A session maybe others uh, also want to say a few things and I'm, I'm not sure if if don is on the call or amanda or amory or yes. yeah they they quite a few they, quite a few of the team is on the call and just before i open that up i want to uh i want to go back to something that uh i kind of skipped over at the very beginning but uh so that's it. Roman, thank, you. <laughs> th th thank you thank you for the for the presentation You've covered an awful lot of material and you've covered it off very uh, in a lot of detail, which is why this is all about bespoke uh, engineering. But it, it's not just about engineering. It's, um, you know, uh, Roman uh, studied architecture and urban design um, and, um, and engineering. And, uh, you know, part of the, the NOR ed and why we're having NOR ed is about architecture and engineering. And I think uh, most of us forget that engineering is such a big part of our buildings and and we as architects sometimes you know go off on our own little paths and 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 think we do everything but but it's people like roman that uh, really really solve all these things and bring incredible um, uh, innovation to what we do because if, if it was up to architects to do the kind of details and uh, come up with the innovation that Roman has done. I don't think we would ever, probably ever do it. Um, but I, I do want to remind everybody that, you know, Roman did start off his life uh, studying architecture and engineering at the same time. And, uh, you know, my, my applause to uh, Roman and uh, to what he's presented. So with that, um, um, we still have quite a few people on the line. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Ilana to um, uh, bring up the question, Ida. Okay, uh, Hassan, go ahead with your question. Thank you. This was an absolutely amazing uh, presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Uh, uh, excellent and uh, fascinating. Um, I have a couple of questions on the uh, museum uh, building. Uh, I am uh, glad that, that there was some intersect. I've uh, known about this building uh, from, from other uh, sources. Uh, fascinating, excellent uh, uh, work. Uh, uh, just uh, one is with regards to the base isolation, and you mentioned that there is a 1.8 meters allowance of uh, movement typically in, in uh, base isolated buildings, there would be a, a moat around the building. In this particular case, we're talking about this being at an elevated level and there is this uh, uh, bridge uh, that connects to it. So I was wondering how uh, the, uh, this movement was accommodated. Um, and uh, the other one, and uh, 
uh, is with regards to the uh, cable uh, uh, that the that, 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 uh, cable that, that would uh, support the kind of the opening and, and allow uh, the stability uh, uh, of, of the opening and you were mentioning that there was this uh, uh, slag and uh, uh, I was uh, uh, was just say, uh, thinking that that um, any sagging or slack uh, that that would uh, uh, be perceived does not really take away from the fact that there would be uh, tremendous tension uh, in this uh, cable. So to actually uh, uh, have the, the cable uh, for such a span to be straight, uh, there would be an enormous force that felt most likely that the, the uh, the shell would not even take it, so so it will always uh, show some sort of sagging. If you agree. Yeah, yeah. so trying try, trying to answer the, the first one. Um, there was uh, the, the maximum movement was 1.6 meters, what, but actually it's it's like 80 centimeters to the left and to the right. But in the end, we had some expansion joints. Um, between the bridges and the uh, and uh, the actual building, I, I don't have a picture in my presentation right now because that would be a, a different story. And uh, there, we had some pop-up plates. Basically, it, it's like a, it, it's like a, a, a an aluminum. No, it, it, it was a steel grid, an aluminum frame, a piece of glass which just pops up in a seismic event. So there was a clear definition of how the bridge moves in a seismic event. It's a linear and there was a hinge, so it rotates around a certain point and uh, it just pops up in, in this in this event. So this is uh, the very basic uh, idea behind it. I'm not sure if this answers your question because it's... No, no, would, absolutely, would it, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, the, one, the uh, 80 centimeters or, or, uh, is, is the actual movement in one direction. Actual, that, yeah, actual yeah. 80, yeah it, it's, it's still a lot, yeah. yeah. It is, yeah. And, and, the, and the other question uh, with regards to the, the pre-tensioning of these uh, cables and the cable getting, getting slack, uh, in the end of the day, you know, all these cable clamps are basically, they are freezing just the position or they are freezing the forces in the in the cable and um where do we have a bigger a better picture but if i don't know i, I don't have a better picture but if you have four points and the ca uh, and the cable is running over the diagonal and it has a it has a big force but it has but it's a rectangle and there's a big force but when you start shifting this rectangle just by uh, 10 millimeters or something you can imagine that immediately the, the, you are losing the tension in this cable because uh, just the, the, the length between the nodes is getting shorter or longer. So we had some cables which during this installation process where the, 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 the shell got distorted by asymmetric forces and glass only on the apex, we had some areas of the building where we had incredible high forces on the cables and we had parts where we had very low forces. So it was also interesting that we had the same effect basically on all four corners with slack cables. Yeah. So that was Just very, a, a very comment interesting. That, that I'm talking about the actual weight of the cable would generate an enormous uh, uh, force with this length and, and the, with the flexibility of the of the cable. Just uh, as a catenary uh, uh, behavior, there would be this uh, amount of, of uh, tension that, that kind of changes with the distortion that that would be the additional kind of uh, uh, tension that would be uh, uh, superimposed on on that uh, kind of catenary uh, type of uh, force in the cable yeah the, the forces are not that high actually it's more like you need the cable as an element linking the four nodes together i think here you can even see one of these diagrams with uh 21 mega newton maximum. Ah, that's something. Now, what is it? Internal force 26 kilonewton, newton, kilonewton. Ah, maybe don't want to give a wrong number, but it's it's not it's not that high. But this is a maybe linear it's... analysis. It's not taking the geometric nonlinearity that would then understand the the, the actual weight in the in the cable uh, and its effect on the tension. But anyway, let let me not take uh, other people's uh, time. Sorry. Uh, for being a bit technical. Thank you. Not a, not a problem. Okay.
Uh, since this is about the same building, David Clusio had the question very early on uh, in the comments. Uh, what is the horizontal glass seal uh, between the shingles and how is the dead load by adhesive or something else? A very good question, David, as always. So um, I think this 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 one can maybe explain it uh, in so we Actually, we had two different glass joints on, on this project. The, the one here obviously uh, has this pressure pressure cap on it, but we had a, a, a gasket under the glass, a weather sealant and a beauty cap on top. So it's it's a three layers of defense, if you will. Actually, we had we had a, a little a, a little curved weep tubes integrated into the gasket system so that the water is running down uh, yeah, with the geometry. But this, that was not your, your question, I think. Um, uh, this joint here was uh, simply just a, a weather sealant, a, a one component uh, weather sealant, a, a Dow product, a black weather sealant, not, nothing very special. Hmm. Does it answer the question? Yeah, I'm just surprised it gets almost horizontal as it gets to the uh, the apex, and I, it just seems pretty yeah. minor. Too no, that's, that's true. Technically simple. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, yeah, but if if it's getting horizontal, it's better having a wet seal rather than having a gasket, because typically a, a wet seal is is tighter than a gasket system. But uh, yeah, but. It's it's always when you build a, a grid shell or a, a dome or something, you always have to worry about uh, the ones which are basically in the in the center and have not no slope in no direction. <laughs> that's that's right. And actually, under uh, on the equator height, we started not having any seals at all anymore because there we sa we said it can just remain open. And and the dead load is it just. It's based on the, the the clamping of the vertical, or is that a? I wasn't quite sure how the dead load is there. A, is it clipping the catching the bottom of the piece of glass, or I saw it later you had some kind of physical shelf or something that you were using as opposed to an adhesive for the dead load transfer. It looks like. So so this is this is, is still well, pretty yeah, much at at the at the apex, but it's the same detail on all. Uh, we have this stepped glass, and it basically just catches the the uh, the lower or uh, yeah the the inner glass pane. Um, yeah, this is this I is. I saw how that it works. question after I answer, I asked the question, and then this picture showed up, so it sort of okay. answered. <laughs> yeah. Next is Carlos. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi, Roman. Uh, just curious. Well, one, I guess the the hand sketches they're uh, they're phenomenal, and uh, and I was curious at the conceptual level, the scale. I, I noticed in one slide you had some sketches uh, that seem to be one to one scale. Is that uh, is that uh, typical when you're working in the conceptual level? Uh, it it really depends on the uh, on the project. Um, to be honest, what we owe per contract is never a one by one sketch, but sometimes it just makes a lot of sense um, to, to work in that scale. Um, and I mean, we as an office, we, we love details and, you know, it's it's not like um, discussing. Uh, should we do class or <laughs> it, it's not the it's not the kind of work we do. We, we work in a very detailed scale and maybe to answer your question. We basically always work in a very detailed scale. Mm -hmm. So maybe also, of course, in a in a competition phase, we don't have to uh, do uh, such three D diagrams or something because you can say it's not relevant for for a competition. But at the same time, um, two forty seven. Yeah, two forty seven. We want to we want to solve it uh, on up to a certain level, and uh, the aesthetics come also from the details. And uh, and it's 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 maybe also um, working with RPBW also is it's it's very special projects because it's the details is more important for example than uh, on other projects when we we do curtain walls or so it's more like coordinating the thermal requirements with other consultants in the schematic design phase and uh, you know the contractor will change the curtain wall details anyways later 
in that case, it's a, it's a bit different because it's an important part of the architectural uh, language the, the building should speak later. Thank you. OK, so we have another question from Philip Bertrand from our Sarin Culture Sister Company. Uh, he's curious if ice buildup was a concern on the Harvard building. Oh, <laughs> not sure if this is a good or bad question, but it was a big, uh, a big topic, yes. Um, so it's it's a very good question. <laughs> Actually, um, we we had a snow and ice uh, expert, and there was some um, studies made made on that, and we got some advice. But yeah, maybe this is a you, you can you can imagine very well that if a blizzard or something hits this building, that and this is kind of an, an entrance or something underneath, so there there might be icicles and and things falling down. So on many parts of of this building, you know, it can be solved somehow with you know sloping the coping and parapets and and uh, things in in a certain way. But there might be snow and ice build up on on this one. And uh, to be very honest with you, there was not a. I mean, there was a consultant, there was a concept, there was a report, and the 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 guys doing the report they recommended more studies and the climatic wind tunnel and. Uh, in in the end, it there was not a big concern anymore. We we had the mock up uh, standing in uh, weathered in the winter for two years, and I think the concerns become became smaller and smaller <laughs> with the time. But if there's big icicles, I mean they have to be removed over the the entrance. I think this is what what has to be done. Is Michelle actually on the call from Benish? I think. She got an invite. Maybe she knows more about. Uh, yeah, I actually, I am on the call. Hi, Michelle. What is the final? What is the final? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Hi, so Michelle. you know, you know what's so interesting? I mean, you can do all these studies, but um, you know, you only know when it's actually built. So this facade has been installed for three winters, and we haven't had any, you know, huge issues that are more concerning than a typical sloped roof. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's been installed for three, you know, Boston winters, and we haven't had any major issues um, with buildup. Thank you. I, I, I just have one, uh, Roman, maybe you can talk to, um, and, and this happens virtually on every single project, and one that you and I worked on, and uh, I won't mention the name, uh, but can you talk a little bit about um, design assist, uh, uh, mock-up, uh, and the importance of uh, full-scale uh, mock-ups and, and testing uh, on projects and how critical that is. I mean, we've got, obviously, we've got a lot of um, uh, a lot of our staff. We have a lot of uh, clients online, uh, contractors, uh, but could you give us our your your opinion, especially on colliding systems and how important, you know, there was a, there was a discussion about, you know, is it important to draw uh, details full scale, uh, and you know, obviously, RPBW's office does it as a, as a norm. And um, yep. you know, Omri's. I think Omri's gone off the line, but Omri and I had this long discussion about why why do you have so many drawings, Omri? And you know, and some of them, some of the working drawings that Omri had, like there were about three or four details on the drawings, and. You know, after you go through a project like that, you you start to realize that you know these these details are really important. But getting back to my my question, can you and 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 you're more involved in uh, specialty buildings like this, the importance of you know design assist, uh, doing full scale mockups, and the importance of testing on 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 complicated so, yeah. uh, facades. So these are. So these are these are actually several questions, maybe. So design assistant mock-ups. Um, I, th I think I, I mentioned on the on the Academy Museum there was no design assistant there. The 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 design there was not even a delegated design. So, um, but we did a number of tests and a number of, of risk mitigation measures uh, to to overcome any any technical issues. So um, maybe I try to answer it in uh, your question in, in two steps. So de design assist. I think um, there's there's multiple ways you you, you can do a, a project. Um, the the more archi architectural, um, the higher the architectural ambition. I personally believe the deeper the design team should go 
before the project goes on the market. Um, this is this is my personal opinion because you know the sooner you start um, rather designing the project in in Excel with you know cost spread spreadsheets and 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 time schedules, the the the, the yeah the focus is is going in a different direction, and the the deeper you go into detail as a as a designer and an architect, you also reach a very high um, um, level of of design and a cost safety level. So this is not a contradiction. Uh, not having a contractor on board on board for uh, at design development phase doesn't mean that you are not having the cost control soon in the project. It does. It just, uh, for example, on the Academy Museum project, we basically that didn't have a single change order because they were just not in the position to change anything. We didn't we didn't give them the power to change anything. We never we stamped the, the drawings and the calculation. So this this is this was quite quite important. So I would I would make two separate cases out, out of that. Design assist doesn't mean like not talking to firms, not doing mock-ups and so on. It's it just doesn't mean um not losing control early in the game. But I'm definitely not saying that it should always be like that. In the in this case, it made a lot of sense. I give you I give you a different um uh, example. And trying to answer the second part of your question, and this might be the best um, way to to answer it. Maybe um, when we did when we worked on the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, I didn't <coughs> mention I didn't mention that in my actual presentation. But the first time we ordered full glass tubes, twelve pieces, we had cracks on th on three out of twelve glass tubes. We wouldn't we we wouldn't have found these problems if we wouldn't do this this mock up. So for the first time, we we know oh there might actually be a risk. So we had to sit together. We had to we were we were flying to China to the glass supplier. We had uh, we have increased the diameter of the glass tubes by uh, two or three inches. We have increased the glass thickness by two millimeters. We had to make sure that the glass edges will be polished in the end of the of the day. We had discussions with a client with a contractor like the first. 3% uh, of clo broken glass pieces are on the contractor. The, the rest is on the owner and things like that. So these are all the discussions which are happening when you do mock-ups and when you find out that there might be a problem. So this is extremely important. The more special and the more unique the project gets um, to do these uh, to, to, to these these tests. And there's not just, uh, you know, there's traditional uh, performance mock-ups where you do air, water, tests and all that so um also in that case you can say uh well i mean pff, last five tests we passed and it was not a problem but it will be the first time when people are coming together to train working together it's there will be an installation crew there's the first time you're ordering the gaskets from this supplier the glass from the other firm and it's it's also training in a way so uh it's always worth to spend this uh this money, if you are, if you are asking me, and then there's a, a different category of of tests. If it's more like uh, performance testing of uh, finding out the, the structural perf performance of glass tubes or cable clamps, but this is more like to find out structural properties or so. You need to design something. Did that answer your question? Yes, it, yeah, yes, it did. I mean, it, it it's a it's a very large subject and. Um... It's Definitely. always the one that at the beginning of the project um, seems to be cut, uh, obviously, because it, there are dollars attached to it. Yeah, and, and I mean, some visual mockups there are done just with timber tubes and sprayed with something so that the architect or the client gets a first idea how it may look like. So I don't see a huge value in doing that. And I would always say mm -hmm. it's much better doing an actual visual mockup because then you see the actual materials, you find problems mm -hmm. if there are any, and so. Okay. Uh, David has another question, so please okay. go ahead. Roman, one thing you mentioned that was a surprise to me at the early, uh, early on in your talk was about how you felt that in North America it was more adventurous and experimental. I, oh, yes. From my, my point of view, <laughs> it's the other way around. I always look to Europe and see more. <laughs> Stuff. So I'm curious if you could elaborate uh, on that. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a that's a huge topic. Um, I think you know maybe the the Harvard project is maybe a, a good example because uh, 
I mean, not sure if I can say that, but I think the total investment of this one is like a, a billion US dollars or something. If, you know, University of Stuttgart is having a new building there, like, oh, can we do uh, like a, a tiny little something here and a tiny little there? So the projects are 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 um, just bigger there. So this is the first thing. And the other thing is that, you know, these all these cultural projects, like the Museum of Fine Arts, this is private money. This is... Um, the Glassell School, this is private money. The Academy Museum of, of Motion Pictures, this is private money because they, uh, there's there's a lot of charity. There's a, a lot of, they're, they're spending more uh, money for these specialty things. When that, That's a bit the reason why, you know, when when we do, when we have, we, we were working on the concert hall in Munich at, at the moment, this is public money. It's much more difficult, you know, we do three years just a schematic design phase. For every penny, we have to we have discussions with the owner. In this case, there was the the Kinder building. The Kinder building is called Kinder building because Nancy and Rich Kinder they are the they were donating I think 100 million or something or 150. That's why they they are allowed to put their name on the door. And if uh, you know if something goes wrong, you have to to call them and ask for more money. So this is a bit how we. It works in in North America. <laughs> Maybe not the not the the full truth, but at least these museums and cultural and institutional projects, uh, there are more of them. And it's it's more. Maybe this is the last thing which goes in in this direction. In North America, there's much more um, collaboration and teamwork. Means that you know everybody wants to build nice buildings. In, in Europe, it's much more like um, blaming each other and always be sure that you are not the one who made a mistake. And that's why it starts with the architects building boxes and stuff and not um, because they are scared, scared to make mistakes. Later, the contractor comes. They are not getting any jobs if they are not being in the, bidding it extremely cheap. And later, they have to create problems to get more money for the project. This is how Basically, every project works in Europe. This is a huge problem. Yeah, and um, it's it's much more fighting against each other in Europe. In North America, I definitely have the feeling that it's more like working together. This is what I definitely like about uh, the, the the projects over there. Not sure we're, we're completely dissimilar <laughs> in all projects. I think your the particular projects that you've been brought into in in uh, North America may be uh, outliers uh, in that sense. So, but it's interesting to hear what you had to say on that topic. And a, and a wonderful presentation, Roman. Thank you very much. That's been great. Yeah, thank you for listening for two hours or more than two hours. Okay, so Roman, I um, on behalf of everybody that's on the line and we have people from uh, Switzerland, uh, Paris, uh, and thank you to the uh, uh, all of the architects and people that are on that uh, you invited on your various projects. Uh, thank you for being on. Um, I want to sincerely uh, thank you uh, for doing this presentation. It's uh, there were great projects, um, absolutely fantastic uh, portfolio um, and incredible uh, detail. Um, so, um, uh, thank you once again, and uh, hopefully, uh, when the uh, Toronto project is finished, we'll have you back on <laughs> in, a, in, in a couple of years when it's actually totally finished. Yeah, in 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 summer or so, travel is getting better. Yeah, feel free to get in touch. LinkedIn is always a good way. Um, if you have more question or shoot an email, more to more more than happy to answer. And I look forward to um, uh, a month from now when we'll have our next speaker and um, inviting you all back. So uh, thank you and um, have a great uh, afternoon or evening, depending on uh, where you're located. Thanks again and uh, thank you, Roman. Yeah, thank you so much.